Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's webcast. Our webcast today is sponsored by Cloudera, and we would like to say a very big thank you to Cloudera and let you all know that Cloudera, the standard for Apache Hadoop in the enterprise, empowers data-driven enterprises to ask bigger questions and get bigger answers from all their data at the speed of thought. Reinventing the economics and performance of big data management, Cloudera is the category leader in Apache Hadoop-based software, services, and training. With tens of thousands of nodes under management across customers and across a multitude of industries, Cloudera's depth of big data experience and expertise are unrivaled. Visit Cloudera at cloudera.com to learn more. Folks, today we have a real treat for you all. We have a Jeremy Howard, and he's going to be talking to you all about deep learning, the biggest data science breakthrough of the decade. Jeremy is the president and chief scientist at Kaggle. Jeremy's passion is applying algorithms to data. He competes regularly in data mining competitions, which he uses to test himself and stay on the leading edge of machine learning and predictive modeling technology. His competition performance history is available on his Kaggle profile. Jeremy was featured last week at our Strata conference as one of our speakers, and his session was so well received and attended that we're pleased to have him with us today, folks, to present this webcast for you all. As we get things started, I'd like to go over a little housekeeping to help you get the most out of today's webcast. You'll want to open your group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for Jeremy. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for Jeremy, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that they're for him and we can make sure we see them for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you would like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you might need to give it permission to access your account. It will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweet so you don't have to. And today, folks, our hashtag is StratacONF, all one word. If you have any trouble during the event, please take a look at your help widget. If you continue to have problems, just post it in your group chat and one of our staff will help you right away. For choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know, we are recording today's webcast, and we'll have the archive ready within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Jeremy for his presentation. Hello, Jeremy. Hi there, yes. Thanks very much for the nice introduction. So today's talk is uh, going to be about deep learning networks, or also known as deep belief networks, or just deep learning. Um, I think in the title for this on the Strata site, uh, we described it as the biggest machine learning breakthrough of the decade. Um, I have heard some people suggest that that might be too grand of claim, but I haven't heard anybody come up and suggest what would be the bigger one. So I think that would be an interesting discussion that we could certainly have. Um, today what I want to do is uh, tell you a bit about what this is and talk to you about why it's certainly um, a major breakthrough, uh, even if I can't necessarily compare it to everything else and um, prove that it's the biggest breakthrough. Um, before we start talking about that, however, um, a little bit of background about me. Um, I suppose given that none of you can actually see me, I should have picked a substantially more handsome photo than that one. Um, I could have picked anybody really, couldn't I? <coughs> anyway, that will have to do. Uh, I'm the President and Chief Scientist of Kaggle. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Kaggle in a moment because it's actually very relevant to this deep learning story. Uh, I've been working in and around uh, analytics for over 20 years now. Um, back when I used to work in management consulting at uh, McKinsey and & Company and AT Kearney, um, I actually spent most of my time focused on trying to help our clients and indeed my colleagues in consulting 
make the most out of their data and analytics. And in fact, at AT Kearney, I founded uh, what really became their global customer analytics practice. Uh, from then, uh, I went on to found two startups, um, one in uh, actuarial services, um, so insurance pricing and analytics, and another around email. And both of those were very, again, very much focused on uh, using data effectively. The thing I like about this, about focusing on this area of data, is I feel like it helps move from making decisions based on who has the loudest voice or who is the most senior in a room or so forth, to making decisions based on um, actual evidence, based on you know, actual data. And you know, I've found throughout my career that there's often a lot of assumptions and expertise which when you actually look at the data, it turns out to be wrong. So I'm very interested in anything that can help us to use data more effectively. Um, so nowadays, most folks who work with and around data and trying to make try and make data decision data driven decisioning more effective, or in other ways, um, research around ways to better use data. I guess we like to call ourselves data scientists. Um, and data science is not something you really see out there in the mainstream media very often. And so it's really exciting to me when the New York Times had this uh, front page news article, which not only was about data science, but was about something very seemingly arcane, which is a specific machine learning um, algorithm called deep learning, um, written by a highly respected journalist, John Markoff. And I thought it was fascinating that this appeared on the front page of the New York Times because it, it was interesting to kind of think about what is it about this piece of news that made it that newsworthy. So today I want to dig into that question. Um, what, what is deep learning? And why is it such a big deal that the New York Times considers it worthy of a front page mention? And so let's start by actually um, drilling in and trying to understand what this article um, actually was about. And it's available online, so if you want to Google for it, um, there's the title, Scientists See Promise in Deep Learning Programs. And here's my summary. So I won't read you the whole summary. You can read it for yourselves. But as you look at it, it's pretty clear that understanding what this article is about requires understanding a whole bunch of uh, underlying technologies and issues. So for one thing, of course, what is deep learning? And so the news is that this team used deep learning to win a machine learning competition. What's a machine learning competition? I mean, that sounds pretty strange. Uh, as I'll describe in a moment, actually, uh, I'm president and chief scientist of a company that runs machine learning competitions. And I've got to say, it's always very complicated when somebody says to me, so Jeremy, what do you do for a job? And I say, mm, I'm in a startup that runs machine learning competitions. And there's always a kind of a pause <laughs> and there's a kind of a, I'm sorry, tell me that again. So we'll dig into that in a moment. And this particular machine learning competition was in the area of chemoinformatics. Uh, it uh, did not do any manual feature engineering. It did not use any domain-specific knowledge. So these are all concepts which, to understand this breakthrough, we have to understand all of these concepts. Um, and in particular, we learned that deep learning has been used for areas like speech recognition. This is the first time it's achieved a breakthrough in general machine learning. And so to understand why this is particularly a breakthrough, we have to understand all of those concepts too. So interestingly, um, it turns out that actually understanding this article gives us a taste of a whole lot of the most important concepts in data science and particularly in machine learning today. So really the goal of this talk is to explain what all of these pieces mean so that we can understand what this breakthrough is and why it's important. I'm not going to go into very much technical detail about uh, how the actual algorithms work, although if we have time, I will sketch out some basics for those who are interested. But I'm really more going to try and talk about um, what 
what this technology is about and why it matters, and in particular what happened in this particular case um, which appeared in the New York Times. So let's start with maybe what's the weirdest sounding thing, which is machine learning competitions, and we'll try and understand what that means. And as Yaz said in the introduction, I am myself extremely fond of entering machine learning competitions. So this is something that's both my work and my hobby. So the first part of machine learning competition is machine learning, and I think anybody who's probably on this webcast knows what that is. Um, so machine learning really is everywhere today, and in all of the kinds of areas on this slide, I'm sure that um, anybody listening could come up with a whole bunch of examples of how machine learning has been used to uh, transform or extend or improve that particular area. So machine learning is, has really taken off, particularly in the last few years. But what about machine learning competitions? What does that mean? Well, there's actually now a whole website dedicated to this area of machine learning competitions. And so for a lot of you, the easiest way to explain what this is is to say, remember the Netflix prize. So a lot of you probably came across the Netflix prize that ran um, a few years ago. Um, it was a $1 million prize to see if you could come up with a better recommendation system for Netflix um, for their movie recommendations. And in particular, what they challenged you to do was to guess for lots and lots of users what was their rating for lots and lots of movies. And the way that they asked you to do this was to actually take a look at um, um, a whole lot of data about what lots of users had ranked lots of movies, but they, they removed some of that data and then asked you to predict what was missing. That was a very successful competition, and thousands and thousands of people entered, and it led to all kinds of interesting um, mathematical and uh, particularly applied math breakthroughs. Um, so Kaggle is a website which takes this and makes it available for everybody. So for example, um, as you can see here, this screenshot was taken a few days ago, and I think these are just finished actually now, but GE, for example, was running uh, a couple of competitions, one around predicting flight outcomes and uh, also looking at hospitals. Uh, there's something called the Heritage Health Prize you might have come across, which is actually a $3 million prize to predict um, hospitalization uh, and so forth. So there's actually literally been hundreds and hundreds of competitions running on this website, Kaggle, and one of them is the competition that's mentioned by the New York Times article. And so we'll come back to that shortly. But first of all, let's talk about why winning a machine learning competition is itself something pretty special. So to do so, let's look at a particular example. So let's say, um, let's say that you're looking at a, a a data set which tells you for a whole bunch of products um, what are the different return rates. Right? And then let's say for these different products you then know a whole lot of information, you know, here's a sub-select of some of that information about where it was manufactured and the price and department and probably lots of other things. So you can imagine in real life this particular data file might be um, hundreds or thousands of columns and hundreds of thousands or millions maybe of rows. So it would be interesting with this data set to see if in the future you can use some relationships in this to predict the return rate of um, new products or products in new geographies or products to new customer segments or so forth. So here's a classic kind of machine learning problem which I'm sure a lot of um, folks on this webcast would, would recognize as being a, a you know, pretty traditional kind of machine learning problem. So how would we turn this into a competition? So the first thing we do is something which is clearly data science best practice, um, although honestly not something I see happen nearly as often as I'd like in real world machine learning projects. Um, so, and what we want to do is to split it into two groups, a training group and a test group. And although it looks here like we've selected some contiguous areas, what we actually do is we take the file and we split it randomly. And randomly we put some of the rows into this thing called the training set, 
And this thing called the training set is the thing that we make available to the folks who are trying to build models. So it contains the return rates in this case and all of the information about these products. The second piece that we give folks is we give them all of the other rows, and that's called the test set. But for those rows, we actually delete the what happened column, the dependent variable. Uh, in this case, the return rate. So the things that we make available to the folks doing the modeling is all of the information in the training set, which is a whole bunch of randomly selected rows. And for the rest of the rows, only the information about the independent variables, i.e. the things that people would use to make predictions about, in this case, return rates. So this is like a standard thing that I would really hope that you would do every time you're looking at doing a machine learning project. Now what happens with machine learning competitions, and indeed it's actually automatically done for everything that goes through Kaggle, is we actually automatically split files up in this way. And so we let people download a blue data set and the green data set, a training data set and a test data set, and we ask people to predict these missing values. And so people literally upload a column of numbers um, so their predictions. Now, of course, the interesting thing is we know, uh, and indeed our client knows, what the actual, in this case, return rates were, or in the Netflix case, what the actual um, movie ratings for those movie user combinations were. So we can compare what was submitted to actual, and as a result, we can come up with a score. So as soon as I submit something to a Kaggle competition, I appear on a leaderboard, and I can see exactly how I'm doing compared to everybody else competing in this competition. And most competitions have a few hundred people competing. Interestingly, a lot of the world's best machine learning experts um, compete on this platform. So the kind of folks who appear towards the top of these competitions are some of the, you know, really are the, the, amongst the best machine learning experts in the world. So this is what a leaderboard ends up looking like. So you have team names, and sometimes these teams have one person, sometimes they have a bunch of people. Um, some kind of score, um, and that score is some kind of reflection of how, basically how many predictions you got right and how correct they were. And you can see also that each person can submit more than once. And in fact, some people submit literally hundreds of times. In most competitions, you can submit up to once per day. And in most competitions, it uh, goes for three months. Um, but clearly, as you can see in this case, this is either running for a longer time or had a higher submission limit. So I know what a whole bunch of you are thinking. Um, wow, well, you know, couldn't you kind of cheat here by submitting hundreds of times um, and each time slightly changing, you know, one column or one row and get the feedback from the leaderboard to try and figure out what the test set must be? And don't worry, we have you covered. Uh, what we actually do to stop that from being possible is that the feedback that we give you on the leaderboard actually is only for a subset of the rows. Uh, so in this case, we picked out a few ones at random which we put into the public leaderboard. And at the end of the competition, we actually throw all that away and we rescore everybody on the rest of the rows. So they've never seen feedback about their scores on those before, and that's called the private leaderboard. And that's the thing that's then used to create the final ranking of people's entries. So the reason that I wanted to go through that in some detail for you was to really say, for someone to win a machine learning competition, it's not something you can do by accident. You know, it's something where you're predicting generally hundreds of thousands or millions of numbers, and you're competing against the world's best in a highly controlled and uh, kind of, I guess, basically a very fair situation. Um, it's something where really the only way to win is genuinely to have a better approach to doing predictive modeling in that particular problem. So to start with then, we can say, all right, well, so this group of people won a machine learning competition. Um, that is, you know, that is of itself somewhat interesting. And indeed, there certainly have been uh, articles in the press about the winners of various competitions um, where that's really the entirety of it because, in fact, every single competition that's been run on Kaggle has resulted um, 
in a, in a breakthrough which has surpassed all previous academic and industrial research. So often there's, or pretty much always, there's science and technology breakthroughs which are interesting. But you know, in this case, almost certainly not interesting enough for a New York Times front page news. So let's dig in a little bit further and try and understand what's going on. So the next thing to recognize is that the particular technique used for this um, is something called deep learning. And this deep learning is something that's been used before in specialist areas like speech recognition. Um, so here's an example. So a very, very interesting video, definitely worth checking out if you're, uh, you know, after this talk. Uh, if you Google for um, maybe uh, Rick Rashid and um, Mandarin translation, you will find a video demonstrating this breakthrough that they uh, uh, came up with at Microsoft Research and the University of Toronto. Um, they used uh, this technique, deep, deep learning or deep neural networks as they called call it here, um, to dramatically improve their speech recognition. And in fact, this video that you can look at online actually shows Rick Rashid talking in English whilst in real time um, Chinese, a Chinese translation um, is coming out uh, through a speaker as he talks to the audience. So it's real time natural language translation of, of spoken, um, spoken English into spoken Mandarin. And in fact, it even tries to make the Mandarin voice somewhat similar to Rick Rashid's voice, um, again, through a machine learning training phase. Um, it's it's pretty, it's pretty nifty. And so there's been some really great success in these specific areas like speech recognition of this deep learning technology. And we'll talk about deep learning more in a moment in terms of how it works. Um, so, you know, deep learning is something which has already been used in other areas like speech recognition. Um, but what is it and where does it come from? So really the where it comes from to me goes back to 1995. And I do hope that this, um, it's actually just an animated GIF, uh, comes up okay on, uh, through this video, uh, through the webcast. Um, what we can see here is actually something called a convolutional neural network um, developed by someone called Jan LeCun. Uh, Jan LeCun is nowadays a pretty well-known researcher in the deep learning area. Uh, and back in 1995, this particular technology was selected by the United States Postal Service to read the zip codes, the handwritten zip codes on envelopes. Um, and so since that time, I'm not sure if it's still being used today, but certainly for many years, um, it was used throughout the United States to actually read handwritten postcodes. And convolutional neural networks is really a special case of a um, deep belief network or of deep learning. And so I wanted to point out something interesting that's going on in this particular example. You can see here in this main area, these are handwritten digits that are scrolling by. And you can see up here, this is the computer's prediction or guess at what number they think that represents. That's all pretty straightforward so far. What I find really fascinating though is over here on the left hand side. On the left-hand side are different parts of this convolutional neural network. And this is, the, um, this is basically a visualization of what that part of the network um, has trained to. And you can kind of see that each one of these parts is finding some different feature of the, of the digit. So this one at the bottom seems to be finding kind of the, top le the bottom left area. And this is kind of trying to find, looks like the middle, and this is the rest, and this is the top right, and so forth. And so each of these seems to be some kind of um, feature of, of each digit, which makes it specifically that particular digit. So you can see it's doing this kind of feature pre-processing, or as we call it in data science, feature engineering. Now generally speaking, in most uh, real world machine learning projects and indeed in most um, Kaggle competitions which are by definition the most kind of sophisticated um, uh, and heavily analyzed machine learning projects, 
really the bulk of the really intense work is all around feature engineering. Um, and what's really interesting about the convolutional neural network is that this particular set of features was not predetermined ahead of time. And it's not that Jan LeCun spent a bunch of time writing specialist um, image analysis libraries to pull out these particular features, but rather that the convolutional neural network was structured in such a way that it was able to automatically find these particular features. It was able to automatically figure out what kinds of features are interesting. And that was just built into the structure of the neural network itself. Um, and it was done by effectively putting different pixels in the original image to different parts of the neural network. Um, and you can kind of get a sense from that that it really was a pretty special case situation designed really for image recognition. And I remember reading about this in about 95 or 96 and thinking, wow, this is such a fantastic technology. What a shame it only works for image recognition. But you know, since that time, um, people have realized that there's a lot of other th things like um, video object recognition or like speech recognition, which have a lot of the same kinds of features. And so this has been increasingly used in these other areas to handle these, these kinds of other problems. And uh, it's been used more and more over the last few years. For example, I know at Google, um, they do a lot of work with um, speech recognition, looking at the Google Voice data, uh, particularly for Android. And they've got a lot of folks working with um, deep learning uh, in that area. Um, so it kind of looks a bit like magic if you're um, not somebody who's built um, machine learning algorithms yourself. Um, but it's not magic at all. And you know, maybe this is a good time for me to give a, a kind of a quick summary of actually how this thing works. Um, and maybe the best way to do that is to draw. So I think you know, hopefully a lot of you have come across neural networks, traditional neural networks before. So with a traditional neural network, there's something that you're trying to predict. And based, so that thing you're trying to predict, you've got a whole bunch of, I'm just going to try and find a thicker pen here. Um, let's try this one. Um, and for that thing, there's a whole bunch of uh, inputs you have, a whole bunch of things you're using to make that prediction. So with a traditional neural network, it's actually a very, very simple model that you create. What you do is you take each of those inputs and you basically weight them and you add them together. So let's draw some weights. So we'll wait for each one of these. And so we weight them all. And so these will be different, different weights, like five and three and two and so forth. And we add them all together and run it through a simple little function, um, generally something called a sigmoid function that looks a bit like that. Uh, and we do this a whole bunch of times. So let's add a few more of these. And for each, the only difference between each of these is that the weights are different in each case. So let's draw a whole bunch more of these. So I won't draw them all, but you get the idea, right? Uh, so this uh, thing in the middle is called the hidden layer, or these are actually more specifically are the hidden nodes. Okay. And what we do is, and they've all got different, they've all got different weights, as I said. Uh, and what we do is we basically add them up and we run them through this function, and then we take all the results and we add them up once again. And the thing that finally comes out the other end is our prediction. And so again, these are a whole bunch of other different weights. Um, so the interesting thing about this particular architecture, this neural ne network architecture, um, is that it is actually very powerful because of something called the uh, universal approximation theory. So the universal approximation theory says that for um, if you create, want to make a prediction, predictive model, um, and you do that by by basically trying to replicate some, some real-world causal system, 
Um, with a neural network, if you make it kind of big enough, you can actually approximate any given mathematical equation, so any given model, basically. So the interesting thing about this architecture is, is it's, you never kind of need anything else um, because it can map to any mathematical function you can think of. Um, of course, the most important thing, what matters, is then the actual value of these weights, because these are actually the things that make one neural network different to another one. And the way those weights are calculated is actually very straightforward. Um, initially, they're just randomly generated. Uh, and then we use those random weights to start making predictions. And of course, those predictions are basically random. So each one will have an error. So we predicted 10, and the actual number was 3, for example. So the actual number was 10. We predicted 3. That means that there's an error of minus 7. And basically what we do is we take that error and we adjust our weights in a particular way based on that error. And that's something called backpropagation. Um, and we do that over and over and over again. Um, and it turns out that after a while, um, eventually, that will, um, um, that will actually kind of stabilize into a pretty good predictive model. Um, here's the big problem. Uh, the big problem is that it turns out that as you make more and more, if you want to create more and more complex models, the number of hidden nodes you need actually increases exponentially. Um, so that was like a huge problem that was discovered um, with neural networks. And the way to fix it is actually to basically have multiple hidden layers. So rather than just having one, we actually have a whole bunch of hidden layers. And this is something that happens in convolutional neural networks as well. And so, you know, just to give you a sense of what that looks like, now we've got our um, inputs coming in, and then they go to a, one set of hidden layers and then to another set of hidden layers, and then eventually they finally make their prediction. And it turns out that this particular architecture, um, you don't need that kind of exponentially growing number of nodes. Um, if you're paying attention, however, you will notice that you're going to need a whole lot of weights. And so you might guess if you do um, much programming yourself that this algorithm really likes to run on something that is highly parallelized, such as graphics cards. Um, and indeed, uh, the group that won this competition did use graphics cards to, to actually run these. Um, so basically, one different feature about deep learning is that it uses this uh, kind of multiple hidden layers. Um, a second difference, and one I think is really interesting, is that as it trains, it actually randomly throws away some of these nodes. So when I'm training a particular data point, I'll randomly throw away some of my nodes. Um, and so for each different training step, I'll randomly throw away different nodes. Um, this is really interesting because what it does um, is that it, it forces different parts of the network to learn for different elements of the data. Essentially, essentially this is part of what allows it to do its, its, kind of its own built-in feature engineering. Um, finally, um, the last interesting feature of this is that these um, intermediate layers, um, we're not actually asking them to try and learn to predict the outcome. We're actually only trying to get them to learn to match the original input. Um, but because they have to do it in this way using kind of um, nodes that keep disappearing and reappearing, they have to kind of find um, um, some kind of reasonably constant parts of the data. Effectively, this is, um, this is really the big reason why it's effectively doing it. So its own feature engineering. So each layer starts to um, basically map to some other feature of the data. So this is kind of the movement that's been happening from um, traditional neural networks towards deep learning. So we've got a sense of what this actual project involved. Um, what were they trying to do? It's really interesting because what they were trying to do um, is build a model for a 
chemoinformatics competition. So Merck, the big pharma company, um, decided, so for them, machine learning is very, very important, and they decided to run a competition on Kaggle around this area of chemoinformatics to see if anybody could come up with better algorithms than they had been using previously internally. And what's, what I find interesting about chemoinformatics is here's a whole area of study that didn't even exist just a few years ago. Um, and yet it's uh, really taking over the industry nowadays. So what is chemoinformatics? Well, to do that, let's look at this particular competitions page. Um, so this competition finished uh, in October of 2012. Um, and it was called the Molecular Activity Challenge. And the description of this particular competition is a pretty good description of most chemoinformatics projects. Chemoinformatics is all about attempting to predict some property of a molecule by looking at the kind of underlying um, measurable uh, properties of a molecule. Um, so two particular areas that I, I know that chemoinformatics is used in quite a lot. One is, what if you want to predict whether a particular molecule will be um, water soluble or not? Another would be, can we predict whether a particular molecule will be toxic or not? And so in the past with questions like this before chemoinformatics, um, pharma companies literally had to create thousands and thousands of potential um, potential options of thousands and thousands of different molecules and have each one tested in a lab for all of the properties that they required. With chemoinformatics, um, the whole thing changes. Instead, we try and create a machine learning algorithm that will predict um, whether or not um, that particular molecule has that particular property or not. Um, and so this is a pretty exciting area because it means that drugs can be discovered you know, more quickly, more safely, more effectively. Um, so that can, of course, improve the profits for companies like Merck. And of course, it will also include, improve the healthcare outcomes because the technology curve in pharmaceuticals will um, dramatically increase. So in this particular case, this is actually a little picture of um, the leaderboard at the end of the competition in this chemoinformatics project. And it's kind of an interesting shape. I'll just explain these axes. So on this uh, x-axis here, we have um, time. So this is the day of the um, project. And here we have the accuracy of the best model that has been built up to that time by everybody competing in this competition. And not surprisingly, quite quickly um, at the start, there's a lot of improvement. Because of course, we're starting from a low base. But as time goes on, things start to flatten out. And each time there's a change of color, that represents a change of leader. What's really interesting, and this is quite unusual, is that at the very end, a brand new leader comes along and actually improves things quite a lot. It looks like it was flattening out, and then suddenly they actually found a whole other level here. You won't be surprised to hear, this is Jeffrey Hinton's team. This is the team that this New York Times article talked about, uh, and this is actually them there, G, 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 G. I'm not sure they're as good at naming things as they are at um, machine learning, but anyway. Um, so it's really interesting to see somebody come in right at the end and kind of kick things up to a whole other level. That's just something we don't see very often at Kaggle. Um, normally by that stage of a competition, kind of the very best approaches have, have all been tried and there's only tiny increments still available. So this is a sign that in this chemoinformatics competition, you know, somebody was doing something pretty new and pretty exciting. So, you know, clearly, uh, as we've talked about, it turned out the thing that they were doing is something called um, deep learning, and we've talked a little bit about what deep learning is. Um, clearly, one interesting thing about deep learning is it just gives good results. So in this case, uh, chemoinformatics is an area that has received, you know, hundreds or probably thousands of man years of research over the, um, the past bit of time. Uh, a lot of very, very smart people have worked on it. Um, Merck has a brilliant team internally. Um, and yet, uh, using deep learning, a better algorithm was developed than has ever been developed before. Um, but that's only part of the story. Um, the other part of the story is that 
the team did not do any particular feature engineering. In fact, they said that they only decided to enter the contest at the last minute, and you saw that on that graph, that yellow, that yellow part only appeared at the very end, and that the software was designed with no specific knowledge about how molecules bind to their targets. And you know, this actually has some pretty broad implications. So the idea that the whole field of chemoinformatics has, to some extent, you know, has really been pushed to a whole other level, not by people who studied um, molecular binding in depth, and not by people who had spent a lot of time fine-tuning an algorithm for the purposes of using it in chemoinformatics. But what they've actually done is they've used a general purpose algorithm, which in the past had been used effectively in things like speech recognition and object detection. And they've actually turned it into a general machine learning tool, which can do its own feature engineering for arbitrary new problems, um, in this case, um, in chemoinformatics. Um, so this actually led to a whole bunch of uh, interesting discussion. And this was actually uh, something that appeared in Slate and New Scientist, which was an interview with me where <laughs> the editor used this rather controversial claim, specialist knowledge is useless and unhelpful. Um, now, obviously, that needs a whole lot of caveats and requires a reading in, in a certain, with a certain level of nuance. But uh, in one way, you know, there's a lot of truth to this claim, which is that um, you know, clearly you need human expertise to, for example, decide what problem we should be solving. Um, and you know what kind of data should be collecting, um, but at least in this case, um, by the time the problem was selected and the data was gathered, the actual part, which is you know people traditionally have thought is the hard bit, which is actually building a sophisticated machine learning model which attempts to use past data to predict the future, well that bit was done nearly automatically um, using deep learning, and you know I think that has some pretty far-reaching consequences. Um, and so, you know, to me, you know, it, it, this is not like this is the first time that something like this has happened. Uh, in fact, if I look at the last few hundred Kaggle competitions, I believe only one out of the two or three hundred competitions we've run has been won by somebody who was a domain expert. So really, in almost every single competition we've run, um, this has turned out to be the case. It's been won by somebody who has never previously worked in that field, rather than being expert in that field. And we've run things in credit scoring. Um, we've run things in um, actuarial, you know, so, uh, predicting claims risk. We've done recommendation systems, so predicting who's going to like what product. Uh, we've done... Um, uh, gesture recognition for Microsoft Connect. Um, and in every case, the winners have been people who are machine learning experts um, and not domain experts. Uh, so really, this particular situation with Jeffrey Hinton's group winning this competition without really, you know, by entering it at the last minute and not doing any special feature engineering, it's continuing a trend that we've been seeing for a couple of years. Um, but it's kind of taking it to a whole other level. I wanted to mention one other thing um, which was uh, talked about uh, in the article, which is not only did the team have no specific knowledge, um, it kind of applied in its software about molecular binding, um, the um, Jeffrey Hinton and his students in this group actually were working with a relatively small set of data. Um, and you know that was intentional. That was the amount of data that we provided for this competition. And that might be surprising to folks who think about big data. Uh, you know, we're taught that the more data you can provide, the meta, better model can be built. Um, and really, I think this teaching goes back particularly to this paper that was published in 2001 by Banco and Brill, 
Um, and what Banco and Brill looked at in 2001 was they tried to build a natural language processing model. So I think if I remember correctly, it was a model that tried to predict for a particular um, English text what, what category it belongs to. And they built uh, four different types of models. Um, it doesn't matter particularly what those models are. Uh, and then they looked for each of those models at how accurate um, it was. Um, so higher here is better. Uh, so not surprisingly, they found that different models had different levels of accuracy. But what was really interesting was that they then tried repeating that whole process on larger and larger data sets. So more and more words in these documents. And what they found was that as they added more words, all of the models improved. So much so that when there was the most words, so a billion words in the data set that they built the models on, the very worst model on that uh, large data set was much better than the very best model on the smallest data set. And so, you know, this has uh, been part of this whole trend and perhaps in some ways drove this whole trend towards saying, yeah, what we actually need to do is to collect more data. Um, and this seems to be at odds with this idea that a team using sophisticated machine learning approaches on a small data set could be creating technological breakthroughs. But actually it's not once you realize the truth of the matter, which is that the vast majority of real world machine learning problems actually look like this next graph. This next graph shows how the Netflix recommendation algorithm as you add more and more recommendations to it, improves in accuracy. And you can see that as you start adding more recommendations, indeed the model improves, but only to a point. And beyond that point, it's flat. Right? And in my experience, uh, nearly every real world machine learning project that I've been involved with, this has been the shape of the data sufficiency curve as we call it. So the question is, why is that? Why is it that we see this flattening off here? And note that I'm talking about adding more rows of data, more recommendations. I'm not adding, talking about adding more richness of data. There could be whole different types of data that would make this more effective. I'm just talking about what happens when you just add more examples of data, more rows of data. The reason we see this leveling off in most real world machine learning projects is that the actual thing that we're trying to model only has some actual level of complexity. There's some, the actual causal system behind the scenes has some actual level of complexity. So uh, in this case, you know, the algorithm might identify things like people who like Star Wars also tend to like Lord of the Rings, for instance. Um, and be looking for these kinds of insights about people who like A tend to also like B. These are not particularly complex insights compared to, imagine trying to model the entire richness of human language. So when you're doing something like natural language processing, you're trying to, um, you're trying to model really the entire richness of human language. Uh, where else if you're doing something like actuarial claims prediction or credit scoring or recommendation systems, you're trying to model something a lot simpler. And that's why in general, in real life, we tend to see this um, flattening out. There's some optimal amount of data to use. And beyond that, um, in one sense you could say, well, it doesn't hurt to use more data. But actually because we know that iterating through different types of models and different types of feature engineering strategies and so forth um, can be a highly effective thing to do. Um, the longer your model takes to run and the more computational resources it requires, that means the less time and ability you give yourself to do all those iterations. So you know, to me, um, this message of use the right amount of data, not as much as possible, is a really important message. Um, and again, this is not new to this competition. Um, in fact, in the vast majority of Kaggle competitions, they are won by people who are using their laptop computers. And the most popular software is um, R and Python. Um, they're they're um, open source free software packages. So most people do not solve you know, these kind of world's toughest problems using big data infrastructure. 
So I kind of wanted to bring all this together and talk about how this breakthrough around deep learning applied to um, generalized machine learning actually reflects three trends. Um, the first is this move from expertise and towards data. And really there's been so many examples in the last 20 years where I've seen industry assumptions which are claimed to be expertise turn out to be wrong and they get replaced by actual data-driven decision making. And I think this is something that anybody who works with data is really excited about. But I also think we're seeing a move from just um, data collection and storage to actually using that data effectively by applying appropriate algorithms to it, so predictive modeling and optimization algorithms. Still, you know, the bulk of the technology vendors, I guess, um, get most of their revenue more from data storage and data querying and um, data integration services. Um, but for companies to get value out of that, they need to be actually using these algorithms. And so we're definitely seeing, even in the past few months, um, an increasing intensity on developing appropriate algorithms. And then finally, those algorithms are moving from being man-made algorithms to machine learned algorithms. What do I mean by man-made algorithms? Well, you know, it used to be 20 years ago that people focused on building things like expert systems. Expert systems were effectively systems where lots of experts were interviewed and asked how they made decisions. And then there was an attempt to write computer programs that reflected the knowledge that was described there. Um, there's also a lot of uh, work done in developing kind of physical simulations where there's attempts to take our knowledge and understanding of things like physics and geology and so forth and map it to mathematical equations and implement them in software. Um, increasingly, however, we're finding that machine learning gives us um, more accurate models more quickly because rather than being built on top of theory, they're being built on top of actual empirical data. Um, so, you know, there's definitely seeing machine learning uh, creating some, increasingly replacing these kind of man-made algorithms. So, you know, to me that kind of wraps up um, all of the trends I see in data science in this kind of neat package, which I think are really reflected in this uh, this deep learning case study. Now, so here's Here's a group, a university group, who solve a complex, very important data science problem, chemoinformatics, better than anybody else in the world um, has ever done it before, um, using nothing but um, a um, machine learning algorithm. And in fact, in terms of actually how they did that, and you might be interested to look into this yourself. Um, they actually used, uh, let's see if I can find this software for you. Um, they actually, as far as I know, they used the Python software called Ciano, um, which if you go to the deep learning um, site, which is uh, deeplearning.net, um, and you can see in the software links, um, you know, the actual very, very fast uh, GPU, you know, so graphics processing based software which runs on Python. It's all available for free and downloadable online from here. And in fact, if you're interested in deep learning, um, this is a really good place to come and learn more. Um, the other thing to look at if you're interested in learning more about uh, deep learning is uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who actually, his team won the competition that we've been talking about today. He actually has this uh, online Coursera course neural networks for machine learning. Uh, now the course is not currently running, um, but if you click on preview, you can see the lectures from the last course. And um, lectures 13 and 14 cover the mathematical details of deep learning. Um, they are based, by the way, really on an understanding of restricted Boltzmann machines. So if you are interested in doing that, um, you know, and you already know about neural networks in general, you should at least make sure you're, you're familiar with um, RBMs. Uh, okay, so I think that's a pretty 
good summary of where I wanted to get to, and it's left me a little bit of time. Um, just before I finish, I will mention uh, one thing interesting today is the platform that I mentioned um, that this machine learning competition was run on, Kaggle. It actually just so happens that today that we actually just um, released a pretty major update of our site. And now for the first time, all of the 80,000 data scientists on the Kaggle platform um, can actually, you can actually connect up with them directly and have them consult on your projects um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So if you go to our site, Kaggle.com, you can see this, uh, uh, all this stuff on our website, which I think is pretty exciting. So uh, Yaz, did we have any um, questions? Thank you so much, Jeremy, for a fascinating presentation. And yes, we have just received a few questions. I'll take them in the order they came in. Um, first question from Fifin. Uh, they ask, is that true that the main difference between traditional ANN and deep learning NN is just about using multiple layers um, of hidden nodes? I guess traditional NN also have multiple layers, right? Right. So traditional, actually, traditional neural networks only have one hidden layer. Um, it was pretty difficult to train multiple layer uh, networks because that back propagation piece I described, um, it's pretty tricky to know how to actually train it back through multiple layers. I actually mentioned three um, big differences. There was also this way that you kind of randomly delete um, hidden nodes as you go. Uh, and there's also the fact that those um, intermediate layers, you're actually training to try and reflect the input, not reflect the output. Um, effectively, they're kind of stacked restricted Boltzmann machines, and that's why understanding RBMs is very important to understanding deep learning. Super. Next question here from Mikolai, um, and they ask, did any other winning team except G. Hinton's at Kaggle use deep neural networks? If no, what's the reason in your opinion? Um, so interestingly, there were actually two competitions run simultaneously for Merck. One was a visualization competition, um, and one was, a, uh, uh, one was a competition we just talked about, which was the machine learning um, predictive modeling competition. And I'm just going to try and find it because uh, extraordinarily, even the visualization competition was also won using a deep learning based me methodology. So here's our Merck Molecular Activity Challenge. Um, oh, here we go, and here's visualization. So you might be interested in actually having a look at the visualization competition. Uh, and you can see this winning approach here, use something called TSNE, which is actually developed by Hinton's group and is pretty closely related to, um, just open that there, it's actually pretty closely related to uh, deep learning itself um, and it automatically figures out kind of the optimal way to, um, to picture uh, the data, um, which I think is super neat. So it's a really interesting question and I think it's really fascinating to discover that in this particular case, uh, deep learning or deep learning related things were used both to win the visualization competition and to win the machine learning competition. Um, I'm not aware of any other um, machine learning successful entries using deep learning. Um, as to why not, uh, basically it's a somewhat new field. Um, particularly applying it to general machine learning. Um, at quite a few academic conferences, I've spoken to a lot of folks in deep learning who told me that they have tried to win Kaggle competitions using deep learning before, and they just haven't quite got to the point that it's working that well. Um, so I guess, you know, not surprisingly, Hinton pretty much invented this field. Uh, it was his group that was the first to crack through and actually find a world-beating general machine learning algorithm. Um, I think now it's been done. Um, I think I think others will follow. Terrific. A um, couple more questions here. I know we're starting to run out of time. Um, question from Jean Christie, a court, um, related to a cross-study tests. Um, is there a typical percentage point, more or less, where the leveling off occurs? No, that's not something you can predict ahead of time. The leveling off occurs at the point when people have 
basically found all of the richness in the data and applied it effectively to their model. Um, and the amount of time that takes depends really on the complexity of the domain. Uh, it's something which is very, very hard or almost impossible to predict ahead of time. Although once the competition's been running for a couple of weeks, often you can do a simple extrapolation and get a reasonable guess at what the final score will be. Okay, uh, next question here from Jeff. You featured tabular data. How about categorization in waveforms, images, and movies? Right, so um, we actually looked at um, images already, which was we looked at Jan LeCun's Lynette 5 algorithm that's used to um, do digit recognition of handwritten digits. Um, they're actually, uh, so if, if, if you go to Jan LeCun's site, you can actually see the papers that built, were used to build that technology, and it's surprisingly straightforward. Really it's just a case of turning those pixels into inputs to, in his case, a convolutional neural network. And so then the values of those pixels are the values of your inputs. Um, you know, honestly, for things like video and audio data, it's, it's pretty similar. You just use, you know, the, um, the digital data um, in some domain. Uh, and that becomes the inputs to your model. Great. Question now from um, Stefan. How should an individual or team decide whether Kegel competitions are a productive use of their time? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so I can tell you what I got out of Kegel competitions. Um, so I, um, you know, so before I became the president and chief scientist of the company, I I'd actually never heard of it. So it was. It had been running for about four or five months when I came across Kaggle. I learned about it at my local R users group. Um, and at that point, I was interested in a challenge. And people told me that they thought this would be one of the best challenges I could find. Um, I was really interested in just figuring out kind of, well, A, you know, was I any good at this stuff? Like I didn't feel like I'd ever really given myself a good, you know, had any way to really test out whether my machine learning skills are any good or not. and if they were good, which kind of things was I good at versus not good at. Um, and I also didn't really know the community very well, and I thought it would be a good way to kind of meet some people. Um, as a result of competing in Kaggle competitions, I learned more about machine learning than I had in the previous 20 years. Um, because you just, you can't, you can't lie to yourself, you know, you get this very real feedback about, you know, is, are your approaches working or not? And I, it's kind of in some way humbling, um, but it's the best kind of feedback cycle you can imagine. So if you're interested in becoming a better data scientist, then competing in competitions would be just about the best thing you can do. Um, I generally find that spending half an hour a day for the three months is about optimal. And you know, after a few weeks of trying to do it on my own, I then try and start reading some papers um, so I can combine my insights with you know, academic research. Um, I also found that I met lots of really interesting people. Um, so that was uh, um, a really good way to kind of get in touch with some of the, the best real pragmatic machine learning folks. So if you're interested in that, then it would be a good use of your time. Um, if you're interested in making money, well, you know, maybe um, it's a good way to make money if you are in the top 1% or so, you'll get invited to um, what's called the Kaggle Connect program, um, which is something where we'll then, we can, if you're interested, um, let you consult uh, through us to interesting clients on really interesting problems. And that's, uh, that, you know, that's actually worth a very decent amount of money. So there's quite a few folks who are you know, kind of starting to do that full time. Um, and of course, it's just really fun. So, you know, if any or all of those things sound interesting, then I would say go for it. Fantastic. Great great answer there. And with that, folks, we are going to say a very big thank you to Jeremy today for presenting an outstanding webcast for us all, for sharing his knowledge, his expertise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Folks that attended, we thank you for attending the webcast today and hope you've benefited from it. And as we close out the program, we would like to say a big thank you to today's sponsor, Cloudera, for sponsoring our event and let you all know that Cloudera, the standard for Apache Hadoop in the enterprise, empowers data-driven enterprises to ask bigger questions and get bigger answers from all their data at the speed of thought. 
Reinventing the Economics and Performance of Big Data Management, Cloudera is a category leader in Apache Hadoop-based software services and training. With tens of thousands of nodes under management across customers in across a multitude of industries, Cloudera's depth of big data experience and expertise are unrivaled. Thank you again, Cloudera. Folks, we appreciate your time today, and this will conclude our webcast. Goodbye, everybody.